Wow, what an amazing praise and worship session we just had. Man, the people were cheering my name. They were saying, yeah, go Misty, go Misty. It was crazy. People were falling out, passing out, running around, sweating, dripping, putting money on the stage. I mean, this was like the craziest concert I've ever been a part of. What? Well, not concert, but praise and worship. And man, the audience, the crowd went wow. I mean, not the crowd, but the church members. I mean, the mic, the stage, the lights, I just get such a high from all of that attention. What? I mean, that glory that you get to God. You know what, guys? I've been in church all my life, okay? And I've been to so many churches. I've been to church more than Jesus because I've been to some churches where he ain't been at. Actual quote. The problem with the church, the reason the youth are leaving church is by the droves when they go to college. I'm gonna tell you why. I'm gonna show you why. Your shoes, they aren't rad enough. Your jeans. They're not ripped enough. Your graphic tees, they're not witty enough. The reason the kids aren't coming to church is because the church isn't cool, cool, cool. What? I mean, you all, like, we're not relevant. Like, that's why I love being a part of this church. Relevant, relative church. I mean, I even have this tattoo on my neck, it's RR, which stands for relevant, relative. I like to relate to the youth, okay? And you old fogies, you old holy rollers, you're not relevant to the church anymore. You guys are so lame, you guys are so boring, you guys are so uncool. I mean, y'all look at me, I'm so cool. I have these rings on my fingers, I have a tattoo, a cross on my middle finger, I have a neck tat, I have a heart tattoo on my cheek, I have piercings everywhere. I mean, come on guys, nobody is cooler than me, okay? And the problem with you guys is no one's gonna go to your church with these boring suits and two-piece Easter outfits on. You gotta be cool. What's missing from the church is cool. What? You know what? People ask me about my career as a musician. I'm just so impressed with how I can bring glory to God. I mean, these young adults, they're not studying Jesus. They're not studying this church. What? They're about cool, relevant, great music. When I come to church and I sing my riffs and my runs, everyone's just so impressed with me. And I'm like, I bet guys up there just so happy that I decided to sing gospel. What? Because I could have been with anybody. So many wanted to sign me, honestly. I mean, you guys, come on. I sang with Justin Bieber. Justin Bieber, it was on YouTube. 25 million views in three weeks. You can't beat that. I mean, come on. What do I charge? I charge about $25,000, actual quote. What? Come out, be my band, I got my backup singers, I got my videographer. I have my stylist, I have my makeup artist, I have my public relations person, my agent, my personal assistant, all the things. It may cost money to do ministry. $25,000, not a lot of money to spread the gospel, right? Just $25,000, I mean, who doesn't have $25,000? Me, the pastor, we get along great. I mean, he thinks that just a little too eccentric, or whatever, but he knows that people only come for me. I mean, come on, you guys, have these churches, they only come for the musicians. I mean, let's just be real, guys. We carry the service. And my bishop, I mean, as long as he doesn't bother me in my lifestyle, you know, he know I like to, you know, have a little fair here or there against my husband. And he knows that I have a little drinking problem, but you know, hey, we all got issues. You can't judge me, I can't judge you. I mean, just come to church and let's just be relevant. Let's be relative. The bishop, as long as he don't preach my business on the pulpit, we're good. The second he does that, I'm out. He knows he sticks with me, he's gonna go really far because I'm up for a Stell Award nominee. I was a runner-up for Sunday's Best. That show don't show what God likes in worship. I don't know what it does. I mean, these people are the best singers in the industry. And people say, oh, you're not giving God glory. It's all about you. I'm like, how am I giving God glory? I'm wearing a cross on my sweatshirt. I have a cross on my finger. His crown of thorns around my neck. I give God glory every chance I get. To be honest with you, it was hard choosing gospel um, because honestly, I mean, I had so many deals and contracts on the table. And I looked over here at Gospel and I said, they don't have any views on YouTube. I mean, they're really struggling out there. If you're not online, you're just irrelevant. You're nobody. So, and I saw that you all needed my help. So I came out here to sing Gospel with you guys. And I hope that you, know, you all appreciate that. Well, because I'm helping you guys here. Yeah. I mean, I could be doing other things. Like I told you, I sang with Justin Bieber. 25 million views in three weeks. Me personally, why I worship, I worship because it's just my gift. I mean, I'm super gifted and talented. I mean, like nobody sings rich and runs like I do. Nobody hits those notes like I do. I mean, you think Mariah Carey had my range. Part is, my favorite part is probably just having the spectators just watch me. They just sit there and all just watch me singing their life. And I mean, nothing beats this right here. Coming to the stage, 
the amazing, astounding, phenomenal, Misty Quinn. I mean, the crowd goes wild. It's like the biggest rush you could ever have. They're up there just like worshiping you. What? I mean, not me, they're worshiping Jesus, but you know, I make Jesus relevant. What? Uh, all right, guys, it's been great talking to you. I had to get back from my set, but I got to sign a couple of CDs. My latest project is out. And I um, have a concert coming up soon. I'll be getting ready for that. Anybody who's anybody is going to be there. So I'm going to go ahead and sign these autographs. What's that? You want a selfie? Oh, that's $5. Actual quote. Yeah, I didn't come here to take pictures. I came here to worship God. One CD. You can. What's your name? To my biggest fan, Derek. Get your $5? Okay. Take a picture. I just love my fans. What? Hi guys, welcome back to How to Church Biblically Lesson 4. This is the fourth installment of the second series of the Breaking Down Bible Study. We will be focusing on worship and fashion, if you can guess from my guests earlier in the video. I'm going to do fashion first because it's quicker to talk about. And for this section, I'm going to use the Pagan Christianity book. Um, I'm gonna read you all a few excerpts. Dressing up for church, page 146. The practice of dressing up for church is a relatively recent phenomenon. It began in the late 18th century with the Industrial Revolution, and it became widespread in the mid 19th century. Before this time, dressing up for social events was known only among the very wealthy. The reason was simple. Only the well-to-do aristocrats of society could afford nice clothing. Common folks had only two sets of clothes. Work clothes for laboring in the field and less tattered clothing for going into town. In places like England, poor people were actually forbidden to wear the clothing of the better people. This changed with the invention of mass textile manufacturing and the development of urban society. Fine clothes became more affordable to the common people. The middle class was born and those within it were able to emulate the envied aristocracy. Some Christian groups in the late 18th and early 19th centuries resisted this cultural trend. John Wesley wrote against wearing expensive or flashy clothing. The early Methodists so resisted the idea of dressing up for church that they turned away anyone who wore expensive clothing to their meetings. The early Baptists also condemned fine clothing, teaching that it separated the rich from the poor. Despite these protests, mainstream Christians began wearing fine clothes whenever they could. The growing middle class prospered, desiring bigger homes, larger church buildings, and fancier clothes. This all came to a head when in 1843, Horace Bushnell, an influential congregational minister in Connecticut, published an essay called Taste and Fashion. In it, Bushnell argued that sophistication and refinement were attributes of God and that Christians should emulate them. Thus was born the idea of dressing up for church to honor God. Accordingly, as with virtually every other accepted church practice, dressing up for church is the result of Christians being influenced by their surrounding culture. It has nothing to do with the Bible, Jesus Christ, or the Holy Spirit. Something to think about, but the only two Bible verses I could find really that talks about fashion, um, James 2 is a really good chapter. The sin of partiality, this is English Standard Version. Verse one, my brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in. And if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So again, the person early in my video, they weren't like dressed up like the person in my second video or anything like that. But they were talking about how clothes make you cool, how they draw kids into church or whatever, how your clothes are lame if you're wearing a two-piece or a suit to church. But we should make distinctions like that. It's not about what you wear, it's about what's inside, it's about your heart. So that's one verse about dressing up. And I'll go ahead and finish that chapter for you so you can know it in context. Verse 5, listen my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? So it's like, you're treating people better because they had a dress. Those same people are the ones who give you hell. They're the same ones that give you problems, but the people you treat poorly based on how they dress, 
Those are the ones who are gonna be heirs of salvation. The sin of partiality, making decisions based on how people dress. But it can work both ways. If you judge people because they dress too edgy or whatever, that's wrong too. You shouldn't judge people based on how they dress. You should look at their heart. You see my first three videos, people that dress the most for church, they be sometimes the wildest ones. First Timothy 2, 9 through 10 is another fashion or clothing verse. Likewise, also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel. Respectable, look respectable. Apparel means clothing. With modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. See, so you can still adorn yourself, you know, make yourself look cute, but do it in respectable apparel. I mean, look respectable. I mean, I'm not gonna tell y'all what that is, but you know, some people would say it's inappropriate to wear booty shorts to church or to have your stomach out or to have all your back out or to have your cleavage out, you know, be respectable. You can still adorn yourself. I still put lashes on, I put lip gloss on, I put, you know, foundation on. I still adorn myself. So you can adorn yourself, but he's telling you how to adorn yourself. Topic, which is gonna go into the next part of the video, which is worship, praise and worship. So the character earlier in this video, she was a praise and worship leader. And you can tell that she has some issues with giving the right person the glory, okay? And we're gonna look at Amos 5, 23 through 24. That's an Old Testament minor prophet. And it says basically that God despises the worship of the Israelites because it is all show and pretense. It's all just fake. And Amos 5, 23 to 24 says, Away with your noisy hymns of praise. I will not listen to the music of your hearts. Instead, I want to see a mighty flood of justice and in this river of righteous living. Like, I'm, I don't want to hear nothing else. I don't want to hear no more of your worship, your worship, your praise. I want you to live right. Do right. So this is Micah 6, 6 through 8. The subtitle is, What Does the Lord Require? With what? Shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? And worship in the Hebrew, it actually means to bow, bow down or to lay prostrate, to lay flat on your body, on your face, on your stomach. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high, which is worship? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with cows a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil, Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? What does thou require? What does he desire? What does thou want? Verse 8. He has told you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Sometimes we think God wants a whole lot of show, do justice, Love kindness and walk humbly with your God. I'm not going to listen to your noisy hymns of praise. There's a bunch of noise. He's not, God is like, mm, 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 mm. I'm not hearing it. I would not listen to the music of your hearts. Your praise cannot pierce and then to the third heaven. I'm not going to hear it. He says, instead of that, he said, I'd rather have this over that. I would rather see a mighty foot of justice. An endless river of righteous living. Is if you all could just do right by everybody. Stop all that oppressive racism, mistreatment of people, oppressing the poor, wrongful imprisonment, crooked judges, sex trafficking. If you would just do justice and have an endless river of righteous living, being faithful to your spouses, stop stealing, stop lying, stop killing do right so please y'all if you're not gonna do right monday through saturday just stop worshiping it's just on sunday because that sunday morning you that's not really who you are that's to show you for the people in the crowd now let's look at romans 12 1 through 2. a couple of passages in the new testament that really focus on worship romans 12 1 through 2. i appeal to you therefore brothers by the mercies of god to present your bodies as a living sacrifice Holy, which means separated, set apart, and acceptable. Holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. That's your worship. Present your bodies. I surrender all. I'm available to you, Lord God. I'm giving you a yes, Lord. Whatever you want me to do, whatever you want me to say, whatever you want me to give up, whatever you want me to go, I'll do it, Lord. Whatever you tell me to do, Lord, I surrender my will totally to yours. I want to be in your will, Lord God. That's how you present yourself to God. And not just saying that. It's not just a talk like on Sunday morning. You have to actually do it. 
Sunday through Saturday. You don't have to actually kill yourself, but you do have to live, be a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable to God. Holy just means set apart, and that's your spiritual worship. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So the person earlier in this video was very conformed to the world. I mean, she just was like, the church got to be relevant. The church got to relate to these people. She was like, I'm trying to be worldly to draw the people in. God don't need to be relevant. He is relevant. If he's the same yesterday, today, forevermore, <laughs> how much more relevant than he needs to be? You know, what is fashionable now won't be fashionable 10 years from now. And but he gonna be in fashion all the time. So how are you more relevant than God? He's relevant. He's the fashion. He's the fashion standard, not us. Another worship passage is John chapter four, the one you hear about the most in the New Testament. John 4, 24. God is spirit and those who worship him must it's not optional. If you're gonna worship him, you must worship him in spirit and truth. So I'm gonna just read a few passages from this book here, Systematic Theology. Wayne Grudem again. He's a whole chapter on worship, chapter 51. He says, the term worship is sometimes applied to all of a Christian's life and it is rightly said that everything in our life should be an act of worship. And everything the church does should be considered worship. The purpose of worship reminds us that God is worthy of worship and we are not. Because God is worthy of worship and seeks to be worshiped, everything in our worship services should be designed and carried out, not to call attention to ourselves or bring glory to ourselves, but to call attention to God and to cause people to think about Him. Everything should bring glory to God. The preaching, the public prayer, the leading of worship, special music, celebration of the Lord's Supper, even the announcements and the offering. Everything should bring glory to God. I want you all to understand that God wants you to really do justice, y'all. Justice is, it's a horizontal thing. Justice is not vertical between you and God. Justice is horizontal. It's how you treat the little man, how you treat the oppressed, the poor, the homeless, the destitute, the widow, the orphan. He says, do justice. He said he wants you just to flood, flood the earth with justice, mercy. You know, walk under with the Lord your God. Do righteousness. That's what God wants. And you don't do that don't do this if you don't do that horizontally with your neighbors don't do this don't let them prostrate love your neighbor so thank you guys for watching this fourth video we will have one more video in this series and then we'll be going into another series the lord gave me to do and i'm excited about that one we have a couple of pamphlets and a book that i want to share with you all from the kojic bookstore here we have 12 tribes of israel colors symbols and fascinating facts so this talks about each of the tribes it talks about like what their name means. Like for example, Reuben means see a son or the symbol of Simeon, a gate like the gate of Sheshem or a sword or their family, the third son of Jacob born to Leah. It talks about that. It talks about the tabernacle here, a little section of the tabernacle. It talks about where they were located in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was divided by tribes. So please get this brochure only $3. McCoji Bookstore. Also, we have this 50 Christian symbols and their meanings. So some of y'all may see like a fish with somebody's car like this. Some of y'all heard maybe new to Christ, wonder what this cross means, uh, what the dove means, for example, or this sign here. So this right here brochure will tell you what all of these symbols mean. You're gonna get like a little emblem on your car, like a bumper sticker or something like that. You can know what they mean. Now sometimes how a symbol is used can change rapidly, so you can kind of find out about that. So when you get a symbol, you want to make sure that it's something that they're still using. So again, $3 from the Christian bookstore. And this book here, this can be a good book here. This is this is a good book for the new believers. I probably read this too. Even though I'm like, I've been a believer for like about 15 years now. Um, and I've been in church all my life. This is called My New Life, A New Christian's Guide to Building Your Life on God's Word. Okay, so I'm pretty big on that. I want people to build their life on God's Word. And it's on men's tradition or church traditions but on the word of God. So I like this book, Following Jesus, Weekly Truth to Memorize. Tells you what you're memorized, main idea, has pictures, has ears you can write, take notes in. I like how this is divided into weeks. So in six weeks, you all, six weeks, you can have a good handle on your new life in Christ. Six weeks, talks about my new life in Christ, understanding the gospel, knowing God, following Jesus, connecting to God's family, joining God on missions. So please, you all, if you're a new believer in Christ, 
please get this book from the coaches bookstore some of us have been in church all of our lives or for many years and we've never been disciple we've never really got a handle on what it means to be a believer in the body of christ so this book here will help you okay please come back for the next video next week bye